Hello, must readers. I'm Erin Papelka. I founded Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. And I am so excited to be here today with novelist Melissa Skulls Young. Welcome. Thank you, Erin. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Um, Melissa Skulls Young was born and raised in Hannibal, Missouri. Her writing has been published in The Atlantic, Washington Post, Poets and Writers, Plowshares, and other literary journals. She teaches writing at American University mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. her first novel is Flood, which I am so delighted to have a copy right here, and you have a copy, too. We have our beautiful matching copies of Flood, so thank you so very much for writing Flood. Thank you. Thank you for having me. They're not quite matching yet. Do you have the hardback? Mine is the hardback, yes, okay. and yours is the brand new paperback, which comes out May 8th, so must read make sure yes next week make sure to get your copy of flood um and let's just start way at the beginning when did you first know that you wanted to be a writer i've always been a writer i'm not sure when i haven't been writing um i won my first writing contest actually in third grade um i wrote for the hannibal courier post it was for mother's day and I wrote that I have the best mother in the world because I have the best father in the world and the best fathers pick the best mothers. And that won the contest and I was a bit corrupted. Yes, I was a <laughs> bit corrupted. I found out that people would pay me for words and that, um, that made a lot of sense to me. But I'm always, I'm always writing, I'm always writing things down. It's, it's how I make sense of the world. So I'm an uh, incessant journal keeper. So I, I don't know when I'm not writing actually. Oh, wonderful. Well, certainly, yes, there is a practice to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, going all the way back to third grade and even before that. So many, many years of writing and work. So um, that has culminated in your first novel, Flood. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell me about Flood. So Flood is the story of uh, Laura Brooks and her best friend Rose uh, in Hannibal, Missouri, my hometown. And it's, it's right after the the Great Flood of 1993, and it's really about their friendship and Laura's should, can I go home again kind of story. But I was, I was more interested in what happens if you actually have to. Like your home has to take you back. Those are just part of the rules. And so what happens if you, if you run in the wrong direction? Um, and, and what happens to those friendships that you, and those stories that you've been telling yourself about who you are, what happens if they're not all true? And how do you recalibrate? Um, I was a history major in college, and I've been studying Mark Twain um, most of my literary life. And do you want to see him, Erin? You do. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay. So I've, I've. That, oh, 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 there he is. <laughs> Just say hi. Oh he's my goodness! Here. Hello, Mark Twain. Thank you for being Hello. on Must Read Fiction. Yes, he's very excited <laughs> to be here. Very excited to be here. Amazing. So I, when you grow up in a place like Hannibal, there is all this mythology. You end up with Mark Twain finger puppets on your desk all the time. And there's this mythology about the stories he tells. There's a reason he's the greatest American writer and that he tells a distinctly American voice. Um, and in my, my research, I learned that the Mississippi River actually ran backwards. In 1812, there were a series of earthquakes along the New Madrid fault line. And it caused the river to go in the wrong direction for a couple of hours. And it must have been absolutely terrifying I mean apocalyptic and I was yeah. fascinated with with that story so I wanted to know what it would be like if I put a character uh, in the exact same situation she has to go backwards and recalibrate um, and and make reconcile her past in order to move forward mm, oh absolutely those are big questions and big themes and with a lot of parallels to the river certainly mm -hmm. you know kind of with the big earthquakes and the, the river running backwards mm -hmm. I mean I can't imagine what that would have been like because they wouldn't have understood the science and so it would have truly felt apocalyptic because yeah, there and would it, be no explanation and it happened in the middle of the night um, mm -hmm. and and as we know floods destroy everything but they also yeah. are great equalizers, they redistribute the soil in an amazing way. And so if you can survive a flood, um, you actually have richer land afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that metaphor to me is so ripe for a character going home. But you know, you lived in Missouri during the flood, didn't you? 
Yes, actually. So I moved to St. Louis in the summer of 1993. So mm -hmm. I had been living in Ohio and we moved in the middle of the flood. I remember wow. my friends saying, what are you doing? Like, why are you moving to this flood? But, you know, where we moved was, you know, in St. Louis, a little bit further in from the river up on a mm -hmm. hill. So, you know, it was okay. But I remember driving past, you know, billboards half covered mm -hmm. in water. I remember mm -hmm. the base of the arch, which is usually like many, many steps above the river, um, covered in water. Mm -hmm. So I have very vivid memories of the 1993 flood. Yeah. It, it was traumatic. It was really, really traumatic to see that much water and for the water to it has to go somewhere and we've built such amazing levee systems but it means that the water just goes downstream and that people without power really don't have a lot of say in where the water flows so i also wanted to write about those characters that are in the low-lying areas that always get flooded yes yeah. yes and so you know there's some really powerful themes that you're exploring in this book you know with the people this question of leaving and staying with mm -hmm. the blood this question of coming and going and what mm -hmm. it brings you know this richer soil but then also what it devastates what it takes mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. so talk to me about you know exploring those themes and yeah and how they played out for you as you explored the novel so when I was writing it, I was really writing the story of their friendship. That's where it started. It started with Laura and Rose um, in a supermarket, just having the kind of conversations you have with people that have known you your whole life. Um, so it started with that friendship. And then it took a while for me to decide to put it in Hannibal, to set it in my hometown. But I grew up with all these statues of Tom and Huck all around me. And I wanted to know what that friendship would be like and if it would be quite as acceptable if they were women. What would that grown up female friendship look like? So as I explored their friendship more, I also started entering in a lot of the history. Um, each of the chapters opens with a historical narrative. That's uh, ba basically, it's a primer. It catches you up on all your Mark Twain history, um, all the books that maybe you haven't read in a while, um, and, and really tells the history of the town and why this is really America's hometown. Why do we call Hannibal America's hometown? What does it mean to be from a place like this? And what has changed and what hasn't? in the town. So the story just kept growing and growing as I entered, as I did more research. Um, but truly, I thought the research was for me. I, as the writer, I didn't realize how much of it would end up um, being a parallel story to Laura's. So I, I, the, the book also tells the story of Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens growing up in Hannibal, and then having an exodus to light out for the territory. Yes. And certainly, you know, kind of thinking about Hannibal and thinking about Mark Twain. So you grew mm -hmm. up in Hannibal. Um, yes. Hannibal was also Mark Twain's boyhood home. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this shadow of Mark Twain um, and how that played out both in your childhood and growing up in Hannibal, but also in the book. I think wherever we grow up, we never realize quite how special our hometowns are, maybe until we leave. And so I, when I left Hannibal and would tell people I was from Hannibal, the reaction was everybody knew it. Everybody had heard of it. Everybody knew the Mark Twain stories. And they were amazed that people really lived there, right? Because it's such a tourist industry. So it was always on my mind that I was from this place that has such rich literary history. Um, and when you grow up with it all around you, you take a lot of it for granted. I mean, we have this Tom and Becky contest every year that's in the book. Um, we compete to become the official Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher. It's a huge honor. But when I studied the literature, I realized that so much of the story that we tell really leaves out Jim. And it really leaves out Huck. We don't talk as much or as comfortably about the stories of race and the stories of poverty and what that means. So a big part of this book was also me going in search of the rest of the story. Where are those characters? And what place do they have in literature? And why are those voices not as amplified? Great questions and absolutely worth exploring. So thank you yeah. for giving voice to that. Um, and am I remembering correctly that, you know, kind of you are now very much so a Hannibal celebrity. Did I remember hearing so that you celebrity. got to judge um, a, a fence post painting contest? It's true. It's true. Um, every year for the 4th of July, we have the National Tom Sawyer Days and Oh, a lot of people come to town to celebrate with us and it is great hometown fun. Next year is the Bicentennial in Hannibal and uh, we know how to put on a street party. And part of what we do are we have mud volleyball, we have fence painting contests, and I was invited home to judge the National Fence Painting Contest. And it was really an honor for me. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations! Thank you. I hope the fe the best fence post won. <laughs> it, it 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 did, but it, there's also costuming involved. There's mm. speed. There's coverage. You have to make decisions when you're whitewashing that are strategic. 
work. So yeah. we take it very, we take it very seriously. It's not it's not just like frog jumping, uh, which we also have a frog jumping contest too. Indeed, the hierarchy of you know the champions of Hannibal. <laughs> right, right. So, we have a lot of fun. We take Fourth of July very seriously. <laughs> yes, it's well Fourth of July. It's it's good times in Missouri. You know, if you can yeah. survive the mosquito swarms, you're all set to go. So right, and it's such a and you know from living there, it's such a buildup in the Midwest. Um, I knew when I started writing that Fourth of July had to be this had to be structurally like the center of this book too. Um, so yeah. I, I don't want to give away an ending, but there's a 4th of July scene. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, oh, must readers. Yes. Make, make sure to check it out. Read Flood. Find out what happens in that 4th of July scene. Mm -hmm. uh, well, congratulations on the release of Flood. So tell me, how has it felt to have a book in the world? That's a great question. Um, you, you spend so much time as a writer focused on that goal that when you get on the other side of it, um, I think we, we often forget to ask that question, what is it like now? Um, and I think I fear that I've just moved the goalpost because I immediately just started working on another book. There's this, this lull between the book is accepted and you're done with editing and then there's this time where you're waiting for it to come out. And so I quick wrote another draft. But it's been an enormous honor. Hannibal, I had launched the book in Hannibal. I went back home to St. Louis and they have been so receptive and so kind and they feel very much like their voices are heard which is not something we have a lot of in, in rural literature, authentic voices that are told about um, change and about what happens when, when the modern world changes and a community doesn't always change. And so those voices, I think, um, need to be heard. But I also have been honored at how generous they've been, kind and generous. And I've been traveling nonstop since the book came out. I've done over 80 events. I've gone to book festivals and and it's just a huge party. It's one big book party, and I couldn't be happier to meet readers. It is my favorite thing to do. Um, I've been teaching for 20 years, and it feels a little bit like teaching because I get to uh, listen. I get to listen uh, to hear how other people receive the book, what questions they had. And I love when readers really feel some ownership in the story. Um, I was just at the Unbound Book Festival in Columbia, Missouri, and a reader came up to me afterwards, and she's holding my book, and she said, you told my story. Mm. And that's about as good as it's ever going to get when you're a writer, is to have someone feel like you gave voice to their story. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm yeah. just feeling goosebumps. Like That'll, yes. It'll keep me writing for a very long time. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. well, please absolutely keep writing for a very, mm -hmm. very long time and keep teaching. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about your experience teaching writing at American mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. um, so are there, you know, books that you love to teach, books that you love to read, um, things that you love to share with your students? Mm -hmm. All of it. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I teach college writing. I teach a protest literature course. And then I also teach in, uh, I teach creative writing, either advanced fiction or this semester I taught a class in literary editing and publishing. So we invited uh, all the DC literary journals in. We invited some of my favorite independent journals like Barrel House and Poet Lore and Gargoyle. We invited those editors. We read their journals and we invited those editors into the class. So it's been really a great hands-on experience. Um, so I just, love teaching what I get excited about and whatever the question is that's driving me is usually how I design a course. Um, but I was also a first generation college student. Mm -hmm. So that first year college writing class is, has my heart. It is really what I know is the most necessary thing that they need. I know that I was a student who was pretty unprepared. And so I love teaching first year students uh, a great deal. In my literary editing and publishing class, um, there's a great book that we use this semester called What Editors Do by Jane Friedman. She is such a generous, generous uh, member of the writing community. And it was so illuminating for, especially for MFA students, uh, for, for people who want to be professional writers. And they're just focused on their craft, but they're also wondering about how we make it as writers in the world. Which are huge questions too. Absolutely. Big questions. Yeah. Big and questions. I will second Jane Friedman. I feel like every mm -hmm. time I pop on her Twitter page, it just feels like a master class and, you know, in tweets, which is fantastic. Um, yes. She's yes. very generous. Very generous. And this book really uh, is the book I, I wish I'd had before I wrote a book. <laughs> she, <laughs> she explains the whole process and there's so much that you learn by doing when you're writing a book for the first time. I mean, and, and yet now that I'm working on my second novel, 
it doesn't get any easier. Like everything I've learned writing the first one, I thought, well, the second one, but you're just always teaching yourself how to write. Mm -hmm. Because it's always new characters and a new world and a new question and new stories. And there's, you know, we all have different ways that we come into it, you Mm -hmm. know, but certainly every story, you know, even if it's like a a short story to a novel are really different processes. So they are, they are. And my favorite part is discovering it and being surprised by it. I love when I go in my writing room and I had no idea that was going to happen. And then the second draft you're in charge. So you need to know what's going to happen, but there's a, there's a real discovery. I'm always driven by questions. Fantastic. Yes. And questions are such a great thing because it's, it's much like science, right? The, the moment you ask one question, you mm-hmm. might get an answer, but then that answer leads to another half dozen mm-hmm. questions or another mm-hmm. dozen questions. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about like the writing path and the reading path is really mm-hmm. just exploring and welcoming those questions. Mm-hmm. I agree. And as a reader, I came to reading so young in my life and, and it was my way of understanding the world. When you grow up in a place like Hannibal and in a pretty, um, in the middle of the country, it's a bit more isolated. Books were how I learned about the world. That's how I traveled. That's how I learned languages. And, and I went to books for questions. They were really my first teachers. Oh, well, that is, I think, a beautiful place for us to close in celebration of books as teachers, as you as a teacher, as you as a writer, and in celebration of this beautiful book flood. Melissa Schools Young, thank you. Thank you for for all of the you do for readers and writers and students. And thank you for writing flood. And thanks for speaking with me. Thank you, Erin. It's an honor. I'm so grateful to you for the service you do for readers and connecting everyone. I appreciate it. I'm grateful. It is just my pleasure as well. Thank you. Thanks.